Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the Royal Society. Uh, this is the second in our series of lunchtime talks for the autumn series. And if you haven't seen the programme for the rest of them, do have a look at it on the website and you'd be very welcome to come to any of the other talks that we've been giving, we'll be giving. Um, the uh, library team has many good members of staff in it at the Royal Society here. Uh, uh, Felicity Henderson, who is uh, very boldly stepped in to give a talk today on fleas, lice and an elephant on the moon, uh, looks after our uh, exhibitions and events. So Felicity is responsible for the very large 2010 exhibition that you may have seen coming up the staircase. If you haven't seen that already, do. It is very, very good indeed. Uh, Felicity organises our events programme for us. Uh, so in addition to getting speakers in, uh, she's also volunteered to do this one, which is, is, is going an extra mile, I think. Uh, the reason being that Felicity, in addition to being uh, a worker for the Royal Society, is a, is a good and active academic. Uh, she has previously been at Cambridge University and King's College. And uh, her book on Francis Lodwick will be appearing quite soon. It's, it's in the proofing process right now. And she's about to embark on a study of Robert Hooke. So um, she's, she's picking the big boys there. So uh, with it, without further ado, I shall hand over to Felicity for some fleas, lice and elephants. Thanks, Paul. Well, thank you all for coming today. Uh, welcome to the Royal Society. It feels very strange for Keith to be doing the introduction rather than me. Normally, it's me introducing another poor speaker who has to stand up and uh, entertain you for three quarters of an hour, but uh, I'll try and do that today. Um, unfortunately, Francis Wilmoth wasn't able to, to come to do this talk today, so I've, I've moved mine. Um, this material, some of this material goes back to research that I did quite a long time ago for my PhD thesis, so it's very nice for me to be revisiting it here at the Royal Society. I did my PhD in Melbourne and never even considered the possibility that one day I might be talking about the Royal Society at the Royal Society, so it's, it's very nice for me to be standing here today. Um, and of course it's, it's quite a, uh, a good time to think about responses to the very early days of the Royal Society because of course it's the 350th anniversary anniversary this year and so um, all year we've been thinking about uh, the foundation of the society and celebrating the, um, the very early days of science uh, in England. Um, and so what we need to do now is sort of cast our minds back to what it would have been like in uh, 1660 in London um, and what uh, the, the fellows who made up the early society might have encountered um, when they started going along to their meetings at Gresham College. So uh, this, this is Gresham College. That's a picture of uh, the, well, it's an engraving of the building where the, the early society met. Um, unfortunately, that building's not uh, not visible now. It was uh, demolished, but uh, it stood close to where the uh, Bank of England is now. So it was over in the city of London, um, and uh, they met there weekly, and uh, that was the the base of their operations. Um, so I'm going to talk now. Um, I have to say at the outset, uh, the jokes in the satires that I'm going to talk to you about are 17th century jokes and they're not very funny <laughs> to modern ears. So um, if you want me to explain where the humour lies in any of the jokes, uh, just, just ask me afterwards and I'll try to tell you why it was funny in the 17th century. Um, so I'm going to actually start with uh, a quote from the diary of Samuel Pepys. Uh, we're very lucky that Pepys was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society because, as you know, he kept a very detailed diary of his activities. Um, and among other things, he wrote about what he experienced at the Society. Um, and so I'll take you back to the Pope's Head Tavern in the city of London, on the evening of the 14th of November, 1666. So that was just after the Great Fire of London. So they weren't talking about the fire, though. Uh, Samuel Pepys was chatting with Dr William Crown, who was a, another fellow of the Royal Society uh, and a medical doctor. And he's, he wrote in his diary afterwards, Here, Dr Crown told me that at the meeting at Gresham College tonight, there was a pretty experiment of the blood of one dog let out till he died, 
into the body of another on one side, while all his own run out on the other side. The first died upon the place, and the other is very well and likely to do well. This did give occasion to very many pretty wishes, uh, as of the blood of a Quaker to be let into an archbishop, (laughs) and such like. But, as Dr. Crown says, it may, if it takes, be of mighty use to men's health for the amending of bad blood by borrowing from a better body. So... (coughs) Pepys was an incredibly enthusiastic fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, He would go along to meetings, he'd come home and write in his diaries, excellent discourses, pretty experiments. He used the word pretty to mean um, interesting, uh, sort of entertaining. Um, Pretty experiments, excellent discourse. Did he understand what was going on? Not, not usually. He he wasn't a particularly philosophical... um, uh, chap, uh, but but he was very interested, and so it's really nice that we've got this um, account in the diary uh, that shows what, what a sort of fairly, well, educated but fairly ordinary sort of person was uh, witnessing when he went along to a meeting. Um, and so here we've got Pepys talking, and, and I do actually have, uh, no, there's Pepys himself. Uh, this is the Royal Society's portrait of Pepys. So here we've got Pepys talking in a tavern about one of the experiments that that happened. And it's quite a nice uh, example because it it tells us a couple of things about the Royal Society. It it shows us the kind of experiment that they were doing. So this was was a fairly standard kind of experiment, the the blood transfusion. They... um, they went into it in a lot of detail in the around that period, 1666. Um, there was uh, another experiment which we'll we'll come to later on in blood transfusion as well, um, and it also shows us uh, something about the responses. And uh, we can see in that that extract that there were two different kinds of responses. Uh, there was first the joke about the the Quaker, the blood of the Quaker being let into an archbishop, and of course that's the. Um, I know it's a very sort of uh, materialistic um, response to it in that, uh, you know, one person's blood obviously makes them into a a Quaker. The other person's blood is the archbishop's kind of blood. Uh, And if you could mix them, then perhaps you would get a more um, a more uh, sort of middle way kind of um, uh, religious (laughs) um, person. Um, and then we have Dr. Crown's response, which was uh, what we might consider today to be a much more reasoned sort of intellectual response, which was if, uh, if, we, you know, if we can continue to do this blood transfusion, then it might be very useful for people's health uh, by amending bad blood by, by the use of someone else's blood. Um, and obviously today it seems very obvious that Dr. Crown's response was was the right one, you know, was it was a good one. But that didn't seem so obvious to the other uh, Londoners at the time, and I think that the, the other people in the tavern had what might be considered a fairly common response to the early experiments of the Royal Society, which was um, really to sort of misunderstand what was going on um, and uh, to, to then not uh, in that sense of misunderstanding to to make a joke out of it because of course we do make jokes of what we don't understand uh we make jokes about what we're slightly wary of as well um and so keep that in mind while we while we um look at some of the other jokes um we also need to keep in mind some of the important features of the early royal society so uh let me just i I know many of you will, will already know this but um of course, the society founded in 1660 uh, in the, the first year of uh, Charles II's restoration to the throne. Uh, it was founded in a time of optimism uh, in the UK um, when the country seemed to be getting back onto a, a more stable footing after the, the well, uh, the, the pain and the, um, the turmoil of the Civil War and the Interregnum. Um, I think it's quite hard for us to understand, but, you know, um, the country was, had been at war with itself and uh, families had been divided um, in, their, in their loyalties to the, either to the king or to the, the parliament. And, I mean, this was incredibly hurtful for the, for the country and I think that um, with the restoration came this feeling that, that, of hope that this wouldn't happen again. Um, and with that, uh, 
it became clear that, that the English people and, uh, and Pepys and his contemporaries um, in particular were uh, unwilling to let... Um, well, they were unwilling to, to think about the concept of enthusiasm, um, enthusiasm which had a meaning um, at the time of uh, not, not, it was, I mean, today we would think of enthusiasm as a fairly benign sort of um, uh, uh, emotion, but uh, for them it had a, a darker sort of meaning. It was um, someone who was enthusiastic, was uh, perhaps um, religiously um, driven and, and devoted to a cause um, in a way that was not going to be helpful. So um, someone who was, who was very uh, struck by a particular um, course of action and would, would carry on with that. Um, so it was a sort of obsessive conviction about something. Um, and, uh, of course, it was these strongly held religious convictions that had led partly to the Civil War. Um, so in gentlemanly circles, in courtly circles, which were um, the circles that the Fellows of the Royal Society moved in, uh, this, this feeling of enthusiasm was something that was um, a bit suspicious. So it was not um, necessarily to be welcomed, the idea that someone might have a very strong opinion about something. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. Uh, of course, uh, it, this sort of manifested itself um, as a, a mistrust of people who took things too seriously. Um, and uh, I'm sure we can all think of uh, people today who, <laughs> who may mock people who take things too seriously. Um, and, and that was a similar sort of uh, uh, reaction to, to things at the time as well. And, of course, Charles II, um, in, in the popular history, was a monarch who, who didn't take things very seriously. Um, and he's famously, um, you know, the sort of merry monarch and, um, and a rather sort of naughty person. And um, the... The tone of restoration culture, uh, in some senses, was was led by that, and so, um, as you can see, uh, this was perhaps a culture in which uh, to be a scientist was not necessarily going to be going to make you very popular. Um, the second thing about to remember about the early Royal Society is that um, it was a, a very new institution. It was it was really the only institution of its kind. Um, and I mean, today we're we're used to thinking about uh, universities doing science, but of course, in those days, they they weren't um, studying science. It was um, it was something that uh, some individuals had done at Oxford. Um, and, and some at Cambridge, obviously, and, of course, people were doing um, astronomy and mathematics, things that today we would think of as part of um, the sciences. But um, the experimental method, so the method of going out into the world and observing um, and, uh, and doing experiments, was something that was quite new, and um, people were really just making it up as they went along. The Royal Society didn't know what they were doing when they started, uh, we had a very good lecture from Michael Hunter a couple of weeks ago, which was called The Great Experiment, which was about the early Royal Society. And it was an experiment. You know, no one really knew whether the society would um, would continue or, or would just sort of dissolve. And, and other scientific societies on the continent did just dissolve because they, um, they didn't have enough people to, to carry on with the research. Um, and so it was not immediately obvious that science was going to be particularly useful to people. And I think that was something that, um, that was very important in, this, um, in the consideration of the responses that people had to it. Um, just a couple of scientific instruments of the time, the telescope and the air pump. Um, that's a picture on the left is uh, Newton's drawing of his reflecting telescope. And on the right, uh, the air pump, which uh, was similar to the one that Boyle and uh, Robert Hooke would have used. Um, so these were uh, things that were m mechanical devices that were being used to help people to learn about the natural world. And again, that was something that was quite different from the way that people had um, traditionally gone about learning about things. Traditionally, um, Aristotle was one of the key... Um, authors of, of information. He, um, he had written a lot of um, works which were very, um, very much studied in the universities of the period, very much discussed, and uh, many people had based 
all their theories of the natural world on on the works that had been written um, in the classical period. And so uh, to start inspecting the world um, using instruments like this was a, a great break from um, the, the traditional way of doing things. Um, so the Royal Society, um, as I said, had, had a, a difficult time working out what they were going to do and how they were going to do it. Um, they decided that uh, the best thing to do would be uh, do a very broad study of things, and so they said they would uh, study everything except God and the soul, um, which left quite a lot of ground to cover. Um, and, of course, they whittled that down over the years, but um, it meant that they had a very wide-ranging study um, of, of diff lots of different topics. So that could occasionally lead them into topics which were not considered by other people to be particularly useful or um, the sorts of things that a gentleman should be interested in. Um, so, for example, we have the flea, a famous... Uh, illustration from Robert Hooke's Micrographia. Um, and so in Micrographia, Hooke had uh, looked at a lot of insects that were, <laughs> were not traditionally the subject of observation. So the flea, um, the louse, uh, a little mite that had been crawling across his desk that he saw. Um, and uh, people responded to this in different ways. I mean, some people were fascinated by it. So Pepys, for example, uh, bought a copy of Micrographia and sat up until 2 o'clock reading it um, and said, you know, it's, this is the greatest book I've ever read, uh, went out and bought himself a microscope and tried to um, repeat the observations. But there were lots of other people who thought, you know, why are these people looking at fleas and lice? You know, what, what, um, what use can come from that? Um, and, you know, the other thing was that uh, the Royal Society Fellows went about their investigations in a way that some people considered to be a bit, a bit wrong for a gentleman. So, for example, they would go to the fishmonger and ask him about um, the habits of fish, you know, what, what he found in the stomachs of fish. And this was quite useful for them because they were able to, from that, to, you know, uh, think about what fish ate, um, perhaps think about how the, the generation uh, of fish, you know, whether they had the, the eggs or, or whether the fish were born, you know, alive. Um, but again, that sense that they could go and talk to people who they wouldn't normally talk to was quite um, upsetting for people. You know, this was a very hierarchical sort of society and you didn't just march up to a fishmonger and start um, getting into conversation with him. Even worse, they would talk to, to maidservants about um, how they made cheese in Wiltshire or, or Cheshire, I think, perhaps. <laughs> um, and so they were getting their information in a way that, that was not traditional. And, um, and so that's the, the point that I, I would like to get across. So people weren't sure of what to make of it. And in fact, even Charles II, who was their royal patron, um, was, was guilty of mocking them at one point. And uh, Pepys again wrote in his diary that uh, Charles had mightily laughed at the Royal Society for doing nothing since they sat except weighing air. Um, and as we know, the, uh, the air pump there was um, an important uh, piece of experimental apparatus that enabled them to find out more about the properties of air. But everyone knows that air doesn't weigh anything. So why on earth were they doing these, these kinds of experiments? So there were serious challenges um, right from the beginning. Um, one of their, their, most, their main opponents in the early days was a chap called Henry Stubb. Um, he was a gentleman who'd been educated at Oxford. He was a physician, so he was quite, um, quite an intelligent man, um, very well-educated man, um, and wrote several pamphlets that were attacking the Royal Society, and these were printed. So, um, and they, they wouldn't have cost very much. The, they were relatively easy to get hold of. So um, people who were interested in this argument would have known about these pamphlets and would have been able to read them fairly easily. Um, one writer uh, at Oxford University, a chap called Anthony Wood, who was a, fellow, a friend of some of the fellows, he wasn't a fellow himself, he was a historian, but um, he wrote about Stubb and he says um, that Stubb's reasons for attacking the Royal Society were, first, that the members thereof intended to bring a contempt upon ancient and solid learning upon Aristotle and to undermine the universities and reduce them to nothing or at least to be very inconsiderable. And secondly, 
that at long running to destroy the established religion and to involve the nation in popery and I know not what, etc. So there were these two problems that um, that Wood saw uh, that, that Wood saw saw Stubb attacking the Royal Society for uh, undermining the universities and worse undermining religion and possibly introducing popery, um, which would have been very bad. Um, Stubb himself wrote more or less the same thing. Uh, he wrote, It was never my intention to detract from the laudable purposes of my prince. So he didn't want to attack Charles II, of course, because that would have been quite bad. Nor to derogate from those of quality who were honorary members of the society. So Stubb, of course, was uh, a friend of uh, Robert Boyle, who was one of the most important philosophers in the early Royal Society. So Stubb's trying to distance himself from attacks on Charles II and from the what he thought to be the, the good philosophers in the Royal Society. But if a sort of comedian, under pretense thereof, of being a philosopher, do, do overthrow that education which is necessary to the church and monarchy, undermine the established religion, and insult over the faculty of physicians, then he must protest against it. And so it's the last thing that, that I think that the last point that Stubb made, which was his key point, which was to do with the, the Royal College of Physicians, um, which was another learned body which had been set up um, before the Royal Society. Uh, and Stubb obviously felt that this new society was going to... Um, was, was going to form an attack on the, the Royal College of Physicians. And so when he was uh, speaking to the, the College of Physicians, he went further. He said, um, others, contrary to our laws, so to the physicians' laws, have usurped your office, pretending to reform the ancient rules, methods and medicaments, and giving encouragement to all manner of empirics and quack salvers. <coughs> so that the faculty is in danger to be overthrown and the nation to be subjected to all those inconveniences which the defect of able physicians and the multiplying of cheating mountebanks can introduce. So he's saying that, um, you know, we really have to watch out for this royal society because what they seem to be trying to do is reform um, medicine and to, to throw out all the, the ancient learning about um, medicine that, we, that we've had for some time and that seems to be serving us very well uh, is certainly making a profit for those of us who are working in the medical field. And, uh, and they're trying to replace it with, with something that, um, that no one knows anything about and that uh, is, is possibly going to be, you know, the, the work of a cheating mountebank. A mountebank was a, a sort of person who um, set up a stall for himself and tried to sell um, medicines that he'd made at home. And, uh, you know, they had to watch out for those in the Royal College of Physicians. So there's all these, all these possibilities for the way that the early Royal Society might have, um, might have been intending um, to, to undermine society. Um, and, and I think these were very real... Um, very real problems that the society faced. I mean, uh, we might think that Stubbs, is, Stubbs was was a sort of professional controversialist and actually wrote a, a lot of um, pamphlets against a, a sort of range of people, but and and used very inflated language at times and sort of attacked people in a way that was unhelpful to his own cause. Um, but for the early Royal Society, I mean, this this was a difficulty, and uh, so what they did was. Um, print their own responses. Um, uh, uh, some of the early fellows printed um, responses directed at Stubbs. But they also wrote uh, a history of the Royal Society, which came out in uh, 1667. Now, that's a history that came out only seven years after the Royal Society was founded. So it wasn't actually um, a history of the society. It was more of an apology for what the society was doing. Uh, and the author, Thomas Spratt, um, basically went out to uh, to convince people that the, the society was not going to cause any of these dangers that um, that Stubb was warning people about, that, that the society was in fact going to be useful, that science was going to be useful. So 
I'll um, begin to talk about um, some of the uh, the actual things that w that were written against the Royal Society. Some of the satires. Stubbs' work was uh, was not satirical. It was um, it was plain attack. So by satire, I mean um, an attack that was mixed with humour, uh, and that was something that the the poets and the playwrights of the Restoration were particularly fond of. Um, and uh, they would uh, they would write satire um, at the drop of a hat, basically uh, attacking their enemies and um, trying to support their friends. And so the people who are reading this satire would have understood basically what the jokes were, and uh, and would have been aware of the the other side of the the problem as well uh, of the um, argument as well. So they would have uh, been part of a, a reading community that would sort of know all the in jokes and, and know what was going on. So the coffee house wits were were major um, players in the, the satirical trade. Uh, and these were some of them were poets, some of them were just sort of educated people who um, who liked to write poems um, occasionally. Um, and they would <coughs> uh, write down their their poems and distribute them in the coffee houses. So um, the coffee houses were centers of information exchange in Restoration London. And uh, you went to a coffee house uh, to have a drink, but also to learn the news. So um, it was a good place for someone to perhaps write down um, a little uh, ballad against the Royal Society and then leave it on display so that someone else could come in, read it, pass it on to their friends, perhaps copy it out. And in that way, these things circulated quite broadly um, around Restoration Society. Um, and so unfortunately, because they were um, often written out and then uh, just left lying around in coffee houses, we don't really have uh, examples of very many of them, but um, this was probably the most widespread uh, form of attack on the Royal Society. Um, and they attacked the Society on the grounds, basically, of uh, the experiments that they were performing. Um, and in particular, people who were um, seen as key fellows. So one of the, the ballads that I've read um, attacks William Petty, who was uh, a bit of a polymath. Um, he had been in, uh, involved in the mapping of Ireland, um, uh, the great sort of down survey, which was, um, which was completed very quickly. He was a very good administrator. Uh, but he was also an inventor, and he invented the double-bottom boat, um, and this is an early form of catamaran. Um, we're lucky enough to have a, uh, a model of it, which was donated to the society, which is on display downstairs in the, the Marble Hall area, so do go and have a look at it. Um, but this idea seemed absolutely crazy to people. Why mess around with um, the design of a boat? You know, boats sail pretty, pretty well, the way that they've been made for centuries. Um, why come up with a different model? And is it safe? So um, there's a, a quite a nice ballad, which I, I won't read to you because it's not very funny, um, uh, about the responses of the sailors to, uh, and the, in particular the sailors' wives, um, to this uh, newly invented boat and uh, whether it was going to be safe for their, their husbands to sail on it. But uh, the, the key writer of poems against um, the Royal Society was a chap called Samuel Butler, um, who's best known for the poem Hudibras, which was a, um, a satire against uh, the Puritans, which was published just, just into the Restoration. Um, he was actually a good friend of John Aubrey, FRS. So he knew a lot about what the fellows were up to, and um, I think it's that inside information that he had that made his satires... Um, uh, that gave them the sting, really, that they had. Um, and so this is the, the elephant in the moon, um, was, uh, was Butler's satire. Um, I, I haven't copied it out for you. Uh, it is, about, if you Google elephant in the moon, you'll be able to get a, um, a, a text of it um, online. But uh, basically, uh, it's a story written in rhyming couplets about how the fellows meet one day to... Um, for a particular project to make a map of the moon. Um, and it's obvious from the poem that they're making this map in order to find out um, how the moon was planted, so uh, the plantations in the moon, um, uh, and that Butler's trying to say that they were planning to colonise the moon. Um, 
And so they're, they're looking through, the, through their telescope at the moon and they see what they believe are warring parties of moon dwellers. Um, so uh, the, the moon people are at war um, and they can see that. And then suddenly they see an escaped elephant on the moon as well. Um, so they're discussing this. This is very unusual. No one's, uh, no one's reported any um, sightings of elephants on the moon before. Um, they, they look again. They see the elephant is able to cross from one side of the moon to the other side very rapidly. And they say, well, perhaps the, the lunar elephants are not the same as Earth elephants. They're, um, they're much faster. They can, they can move across the moon very quickly. So meanwhile, um, there are quite a lot of discussions taking place. The fellows are sort of pontificating about um, uh, the, the lunar dwellers and the moon, and they decide to write down a, an account of it that they can all sign so that uh, other people will know that this is the truth. Um, and we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, while the fellows are discussing this, their very bored servants decide to take a look through the telescope. Um, and discover that uh, actually the elephant is a mouse that's trapped inside the telescope and has um, by that stage crawled down to the front of the telescope and they, they can see it there. Uh, so, so there's a mouse in the telescope and the lunar dwellers on second inspection are a cloud of flies and gnats that are flying around the top end of the telescope as well. So the footboys alert the Royal Society Fellows <laughs> to this. And uh, there's a great argument, of course, that, um, you know, is it, is it an elephant or is it a mouse? Um, some of the fellows come out uh, in favour of the mouse party. Some of the fellows come out in favour of the elephant party. And the meeting breaks up in disarray. Um, and... And uh, Butler's point in this, I mean, it's, it's partly a satire on um, uh, the idea that people can see, uh, can see things in the telescope. There was, a very, there was a period when it was very difficult to know whether what you saw through a telescope was the truth or not. And I mean, again, we're very familiar with the idea of using instruments that are extensions of our natural Senses, so that that um, you know that that uh, improve our sight, either through the telescope or the microscope. Uh, other senses, hearing, obviously, but in the early days of these inventions, it wasn't quite clear whether people were seeing things that were real or were were pretend. I mean, if you if you could only see something through the telescope, you couldn't really verify um, that what you were seeing was true. And of course, the image was a bit fuzzy. Um, the, uh, the, the lens technology wasn't fantastic. And so I think what Butler's doing here is saying, you know, hang on, how can you be sure what you're seeing through that telescope is what you think it is? I mean, that's the key thing. The, the fellows are seeing something, but their interpretation is incorrect. Um, and Butler's saying, you know, the fact that you're all wrong suggests that a society of fellows is not necessarily better than one person looking at something um, and that one person looking at something and saying, oh, it's, a, it's an elephant, can then influence the entire society to say, oh, it's an elephant, clearly. Um, and I think Butler's trying to say that this experimental method needs to be considered a little bit more. So um, the early fellows were... Um, uh, one of their, their ways of uh, verifying things was to, to get lots of people to do it and lots of people to look at the experiment. So it was this sort of witnessing um, which proved the experiment. And Butler, I think, here is saying the fact that so many people have witnessed it doesn't necessarily make it true um, and that, that you can still be confused by what you've seen. Um, and also the fact that the, his fellows you know, get into an argument and then... Um, uh, can't decide what what's right or what's wrong. I mean, it's um, it, obviously it's inflated. Um, Butler wasn't trying to say that the fellows were always, um, you know, making things up. But I think uh, in the satire, he's he's pointing out something which the early watchers of the Royal Society, people who were not in the society but but were watching what was going on, um, may have had concerns about. Um, so Butler was friends with some of the other restoration wits, uh, including playwrights and, uh, and poets. Um, some of these poets were extremely um, 
ex extremely naughty people who uh, who wrote very rude poetry, but uh, we won't go into that, um, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> So one of the, the most uh, famous satires was um, The Virtuoso, which was a satire on uh, the Royal Society Fellows written in play form, um, and uh, it was performed in front of um, uh, many people in London. It was a very popular play. It's a very funny play, actually. Um, if, you, if you see a performance of it advertised, do go to it, because it's still, it's still very funny, worthwhile. Um, so it's a restoration comedy with uh, the usual characters, the hero, um, the, the young girls that the heroes are trying to, uh, to marry, but the key characters for us are um, Sir Nicholas Gimcrack, who is the virtuoso. Virtuoso was another word for um, for an experimental philosopher. It was someone who um, who was uh, curious about the natural world. Um, and so, they, uh, and also, uh, there's a couple of other humorous um, characters. Well, uh, you can tell from their names. Um, so, formal trifle who was a great orator, felt himself to be a great orator, and uh, Sir Samuel Harty, who was a great wit. Um, and so the virtuoso is described as uh, the finest speculative gentleman in the whole world, um, but his nieces call him a sot that has spent £2,000 in microscopes to find out the nature of eels in vinegar, mites in a cheese, and the blue of plums. Uh, which is the sort of sheen on a plum, which he has subtly found out to be living creatures. One who has broken his brains about the nature of maggots, who has studied these 20 years to find out the several sorts of spiders and never cares for understanding mankind. Um, and uh, so the whole idea of this is that uh, Nicholas Gimcrack is, um, is very educated in uh, philosophy, but is complete, a complete fool when it comes to understanding people. And, um, of course, the, the young lovers get the better of him and are able to, to end happily, and, and that's because it's a comedy. Um, but uh, we're introduced to Gimcrack in his laboratory, um, learning to swim. And uh, one of the characters says to his wife, "'Is there any water hereabouts, madam?' His wife says, "'He does not learn to swim in the water, sir.' "'Not in the water, madam. How, then?' in his laboratory, a spacious room where all his instruments and fine knacks are. But how is this possible? He has a frog in a bowl of water, tied with a pack thread by the loins, <coughs> which pack thread Sir Nicholas holds in his teeth, lying upon his belly on a table, and as the frog strikes, he strikes and his swimming master stands by to tell him when he does well or ill. So basically he's, uh, he's lying on a table in um, his laboratory with a frog swimming in water in front of him, mimicking the actions of the frog, with his swimming master standing next to him, telling him whether he's done the correct action or not. And um, when, you know, he, the, the, the heroes sort of bait him a little bit and say, um, uh, have you ever tried in the water, sir? And he says... No, but I swim most exquisitely on land. And he says, do you intend to practice in the water, sir? Never, sir. I hate the water. I never come upon the water. I content myself with the speculative part of swimming. I care not for the practic. I seldom bring anything to use. Tis not my way. Knowledge is my ultimate end. So, uh, again, you know, it's lighthearted, it's, it's, it's funny, but um, the idea is that uh, this, this chap is um, very busily learning how to swim. It will never be put to any use. Um, and the whole play goes on uh, like this. And uh, unfortunately, um, for the Fellows of the Royal Society, Shadwell was quite um, knowledgeable about what they'd been up to and uh, had read Micrographia and uh, understood you know, the experiments pretty well, and um, basically uh, satirised the fellows in Nicholas Gimcrack. And un uh, poor Hook, uh, Robert Hook, went along to, to one of the performances and wrote in his diary later on, um, uh, Vindicat me Deus, which means God avenge me, um, damned dogs, people almost pointed... So uh, he certainly believed that um, Gimcrack was based in part on him and, and of course, you would because um, it was mainly his own research that was being satirised. Um, I'll quickly go on to uh, the another, um, what I think is a sl slightly more amusing um, uh, 
uh, piece of text that was published in 1700. Um, this is a dialogue which was written by a chap called William King. Um, now, King was not a fellow of the Royal Society, and this was published anonymously. Uh, and it is an attack on uh, Sir Hans Sloane, who at that point was um, the secretary of the society and was publishing the Philosophical Transactions. And King had... Uh, for some reason, a dreadful dislike of Sloane and of his, pol uh, his publishing policy. Um, and he, he's extremely rude about Sloane in the, the preface, under cover of anonymity. And the, the Royal Society didn't know who it was who was, um, who was publishing these uh, tracts. So um, this is the table of contents um, from the transactioneer. So it's, it's very obvious what he's, you know, what, what he's doing. Um, the, the Philosophical Transactions was quite widely read and um, he makes no pretense of, of doing anything other than attacking Sloane. Um, so as you can see, this is a sort of parodic table of contents, um, but all these things are taken from the real Philosophical Transactions. So, um, I mean, my favourite one is Swallowing Pebbles Dangerous and Why? Um, but then also Picking the Ears Too Much dangerous. Um, the beans that travelled from Jamaica to Ireland, that's quite an interesting one. Drunkards not drowned by drinking. That men can't swallow when they're dead. Um, on the next page there's uh, some, some more. Um, a shower of whitings and a shower of butter to dress them with. Um, so the articles that, that King is attacking in uh, the transaction here um, fall into three categories. Um, very obvious, so, uh, for example, swallowing pebbles dangerous and why? <laughs> yeah. um, the extremely unlikely account, which was sometimes published in the Filtrans, so um, the shower of whiting, for example. Um, showers of fish occasionally do make it into the news, uh, and they did make it into the Filtrans, but King felt that that was something that should not have gone into the Filtrans because clearly it was... Um, you know, too too weird for him. Um, and finally, there's a, a third kind of account, which is um, uh, the account that relies on circumstantial evidence um, where too much information is provided. So it's a, it's a slightly sort of um, perhaps a scatological kind of account. And um, again, this was the, the sort of response of the gentleman to um, someone who was looking at things in a way that was felt to be um, not very gentlemanly. Um, so um, basically this is in the format of a dialogue um, where King prints extracts from the philosophical transactions in italics so that you know exactly which words are Sloane's words and which words King is interjecting into it. Um, and he talks about Sloane, he's Sloane, as a natural historian. Um, and he says, what are the most considerable passages in natural history which he hath taken notice of? And then, so this is the gentleman. And then the virtuoso, which is obviously a different virtuoso from um, Shadwell's, but they're using the same name because it's, it's well known as a sort of humorous um, uh, depiction of a scientist. So the virtuoso says, the first piece I shall mention is an account of a China cabinet, which uh, appeared in the Philosophical Transactions. This, sir, is a rarity that few people have thought worth their while to write dissertations about, or indeed worth their notice. But I can assure you, our virtuoso, who is indeed the wonder of his age, values it at a high rate, and hath taken care to adorn several of the transactions with an account of its contents, the contents of the China cabinet, and hath engraven them curiously upon copper plates. See transactions number 346. So if we do that, we find the following illustration, which is of... Um, uh, so there was a case of surgical instruments which was sent to the Royal Society from uh, the East Indies, and um, this was an engraving of the contents of the case. Uh, and the gentleman says, Oh, dear, a great deal of curiosity must needs lie in those things. And the curiosity of the doctor as well as his humility in stooping to take notice of such trifles is very commendable. The virtuoso says, Sir, he hath not so much as neglected an ear picker or a rusty razor, for he values anything that comes from the Indies or China at a high rate. Um, 
And then the gentleman says, pray, do you remember whose picture that is that is graven among the razors and toothpickers? What, is it the author's? Fie, no, it's a Chinese figure, wherein is represented one of that nation using one of these instruments, that is an ear picker, and expressing great satisfaction therein. See transaction number 246. A great deal of satisfaction indeed for a man to stand picking his ears. Why, pray, of what use are the China ear pickers of in the way of knowledge? Why, the learned author hath made this useful comment upon it. Says he, whatever pleasures the Chinese may take in picking their ears, thus, I am certain most people in those parts who have had their hearing impaired have had such misfortunes first come to them by picking their ears too much. Why then were they brought into these parts if they be of such mischievous consequence? The chief design was to entertain the philosophical secretary, for he took as much satisfaction in looking upon the ear picker as the Chinese could do in picking his ears. So that was, uh, you know, obviously a joke then aimed at Sloane. Um, I see we're getting quite a way on into the um, hour, so I'm going to round up with um, a very quick mention of uh, the final um, text that, that really made it... Um, into uh, a wide circulation, which was Gulliver's Travels, which you, you may or may not know, had a section on it really devoted to attacking the Royal Society in the form of the Grand Academy of Legado, uh, which is when Royal, uh, Gulliver goes to um, Laputa, the, the country of Laputa. Um, and in the Grand Academy, um, Gulliver visits uh, rooms where people are doing such things as extracting sunbeams out of cucumbers, uh, so the, the chap there believes that he has almost got enough sunshine to heat the governor's garden for the, for the next uh, winter. Um, also projects to reduce human excrement to its original food. Um, a new method for building houses by beginning at the roof and working downward to the foundation. Um, and uh, the idea that pigs might plough fields by planting pieces of food in the ground and then letting the pigs into the field to go and dig them up. And of course, unfortunately, Gulliver's told, this is, uh, this, you know, this is not a very uh, useful method of, I mean, it does get the, the ground um, plowed, but uh, it's a great deal of trouble and expense. So again, um, uh, Swift is satirizing the experiments uh, rather than the people, but, um, uh, at that stage, he was, he was publishing that in 1726. It was getting a bit old. Um, so the, the society by that stage had got onto a, a much more stable footing. Um, Newton was president at that time, although he was about to die, 1727. Um, and the fellows of the society had a lot more um, uh, gravity about them. People began to understand that science was going to be useful and... Uh, Although they continued to mock scientists really probably up until the present day, um, uh, the same sorts of satires were not, um, not at, uh, attacking the Royal Society. I'll finish there. Thank you.